Karen Wetterhan was an internationally respected professor of chemistry and an expert on heavy metals' effects on living systems, especially their role in causing cancer. She was a rising star and destined to become one of the most celebrated professors Dartmouth College, New Hampshire had ever seen. During the 20 years Karen dedicated to the college, she published more than 85 research papers and helped establish the Women in Science Project, which enabled women to increase their share of science majors from 13 to 25%. However, the heavy metals she so passionately researched to save others, by a cruel irony, took her life in the most heartbreaking way imaginable. This is the tragic and disturbing story of Karen Wetterhan. As you'll soon learn, this video is about the sad story of someone who wasn't able to beat the odds. But in a recent documentary we've been watching, there are over a dozen stories of people who survived, despite the terrible situations they found themselves in. We'd like to thank Magellan TV for sponsoring this video. If you haven't heard about them by now, then we'd be surprised, since they're a rising star in streaming services, and one of the highest rated documentary streaming apps on Google Play. Magellan TV is an amazing service, since they have hundreds of incredible documentaries on a wide range of topics, from true crime to ancient history, as well as TV shows you'll want to sit down and binge in one night. All the shows are in 4K, and even better, there are no ads, ever. The quality and the price point mean that Magellan TV is great for your own personal watching, but it could also make a thoughtful gift. Magellan TV offers membership gift cards all year round, and it would make the perfect present this Christmas. We know lots of people who are into true crime and creepy stories, and we're planning to give them the gift of hours of entertainment this year by giving them a Magellan subscription. And with over 20 hours of new content being added every week, they are always going to find something they enjoy. The documentary that we've been enjoying is called Alive, Surviving Catastrophe. The show explores disasters that made the news all around the world for weeks, or even months or years in some cases. It dives into the stories of humans behind the headlines, which we really appreciate here at Top Fives. Magellan shares our passion for the drama of real life, showing how these people were able to survive even the most nightmarish scenarios. We really enjoyed the episode about the Wyoming Ice Cave, a tense look at what happens when things go wrong while you're out in nature, and some of the techniques the couple use to get through their ordeal, including using hair to get a fire going. Use the link in the description to get a free month trial to discover your next favorite show, and check out the gift cards so you can give the gift of great TV. Now, if you haven't already done so, hit those lights, sit back, and enjoy. Karen was born on October 16, 1948, in Plattsburgh, New York. As an adult, she studied at St. Lawrence University, where she earned her bachelor's degree in 1970, and went on to study for a doctorate at Columbia University, where pioneering scientist Stephen James Lippard supervised her. In 1976, Karen joined Dartmouth College faculty, becoming the first woman hired into a tenure-track position in the chemistry department. Her research focused on understanding how the heavy metal coronium damages DNA and causes cancer. Karen was ambitious and very talented, but was also known to be kind and generous to her colleagues and friends, and an inspirational mentor to her students. As well as her research, Karen took on administrative roles, and in 1995, she was appointed Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, the third highest position at the university, she also established Dartmouth's Toxic Metal Superfund research program, something that many believed would have earned her a Presley Medal, the highest honor awarded by the American Chemistry Society. Karen's potential was limitless, but sadly, it would come to a sudden and unexpected end after a lab incident on August 4th, 1996. By 1996, Karen was at the point in her career where she didn't get much time to perform experiments, but on this day, she had a task she didn't want anyone else to perform. Karen had collaborated with colleagues at Harvard University and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to study zinc proteins that repair DNA damage. Understanding DNA and how these repairs occurred could offer insight into how the damage happened in the first place. Using a technique called Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Spectroscopy, or NMR for short. Their aim was to determine the content and purity of a sample, as well as its molecular structure. However, zinc wasn't easily seen by NMR, so they made the compounds using mercury instead, whose Hg isotope can be measured with NMR. In initial tests, the group used a mercury chloride standard, 
but Karen wasn't satisfied with the results. So to ensure accurate readings, she turned to the consummate and most dangerous substance for a mercury MNR standard, dimethylmercury. Dimethylmercury is an extremely toxic organomercury compound. It is a highly volatile, reactive, flammable, and colorless liquid, and is one of the strongest known neurotoxins in the world. A quantity of less than 0.1 milliliters is capable of inducing severe mercury poisoning, resulting in death. It is easily absorbed through the skin and is capable of penetrating many materials, including plastic and rubber compounds. Due to its toxicity, it has few uses and has effectively been rendered obsolete in organic chemistry, largely abandoned in favor of the less toxic ethyl mercury compounds, which perform a similar function but without the bioaccumulation hazard. In fact, one eminent scientist labeled dimethylmercury deadly and hideous. However, if a human is exposed to dimethylmercury, they might not immediately feel unwell, but after several weeks, the compound will metabolize to methylmercury, enabling it to easily cross the blood-brain barrier. Once in the brain, methylmercury interferes with the processes that protect neurons from oxidation, and it stimulates an immune response that attacks proteins vital to brain function. Once this happens, it is not easy to eradicate from the body and will quietly but lethally bioaccumulate. Symptoms of toxicity can be delayed for weeks, even months, meaning that it is often too late for effective treatment to be administered. At first, symptoms may be vague and include headaches, hearing impairment, and paresthesia, a burning or prickling sensation that is usually felt in the hands, arms, legs, or feet. These get progressively worse, leading to poor muscle control, speech impairment, blindness, and eventually death. Karen would have been well aware of the dangers of handling dimethylmercury and adhered to all the safety regulations in place at the time, and began preparing the mercury samples for NMR spectroscopy. She was wearing a lab coat, along with goggles and disposable latex gloves, and as the substance posed a risk through inhalation, Whilst transferring the dimethylmercury from a sealed glass ampoule into an NMR tube, she wore a fume hood. So when her pipette spilled one or two droplets onto her left-hand glove, Karen was not especially concerned. The tiny spill caused her no pain. In fact, she would barely have known it was there and had no reason to think the incident was serious. At the time, no one else was aware the spill had happened. Five months after the incident, Karen rapidly started to develop symptoms, and during a lunch date in early January 1997, her friend Kathy Johnson urged Karen to see a doctor. By now she began noticing tingling in her lower extremities and had stomach problems. But even more worrying was she started to stumble while walking. Her speech began to slur, and her sight and hearing were impaired. After visiting the hospital, Karen received the devastating diagnosis of severe mercury toxicity. It was only then she remembered the spilled droplets, but had been unaware the substance had permeated her glove and seeped into her skin. To put into context the depth of her contamination, the toxic threshold for human mercury content is 50 micrograms per liter. Karen's exposure was around 80 times greater at 4,000 micrograms per liter. Toxicologists considered over 200 micrograms per liter to be a lethal dose. Few people in the world understood toxic metals as well as Karen, and at that point, she would have known her prognosis was grim. Karen immediately started a treatment known as chelation therapy, which sought to convert the mercury within her body into a substance that she could excrete. However, it's easier for the body to expel mercury salt than dimethylmercury, and sadly, five months after exposure, the chance of any therapy working was slim. As her senses continued diminishing, she must have known that she was dying, and urged her department chairman to alert persons in her line of work about the extreme hazards of dimethylmercury. She also asked for everyone in her lab to be tested, and for the word to get out to the chemistry community. Just three weeks after Karen's symptoms surfaced, she fell into a coma, and her brilliant mind remained in a vegetative state until she died on the 8th of June 1998, at the age of 48, leaving behind her husband and two children. Karen's death caused shock, 
horror and disbelief within the scientific community and her research group. They all knew lab work was hazardous, especially when working with toxic substances like heavy metals. But until Karen's death, few of them realized just how deadly dimethylmercury was and how inadequate laboratory safeguards were. Many experienced chemists were stunned by the idea that only a few drops of the substance could have killed their colleague, and they struggled to understand Karen's death. No one knew exactly how many drops of dimethylmercury landed on Karen's glove, or how much of her body absorbed, and investigators took steps to rule out other possible explanations for her mercury exposure. Her close family and other members of her research group were tested for mercury, but were all within the normal range. The only place mercury was detected in Karen's lab was in the hood she used on the day of the incident. Whilst Karen was still alive but in hospital, doctors collected a sample of her hair. Organic mercury compounds accumulate in hair and nails, and as they grow, they become a timeline of exposure. The strand of hair gave a definitive answer with a rapid increase in mercury levels, corresponding to the approximate date that Karen recalled her exposure, effectively ruling out any other source of poisoning. Armed with this information, tests were carried out to see the permeation rate of dimethylmercury on several types of disposable gloves, typically used in laboratories and clinical settings. And alarmingly, even the most robust neoprene gloves had a permeation rate of less than 10 minutes, and other gloves as short as 15 seconds. As it's believed Karen was wearing standard latex gloves, she would have had little protection from the deadly substance after the spillage and from the date of exposure, the clock was ticking down to a demise. In reality, the only reliable protective equipment was a neoprene glove worn over a laminated plastic glove. Sadly, these tests were carried out too late to save Karen, and if she hadn't died, they may never have been carried out. Thankfully, as a direct result of the tragedy, the American Occupational Safety and Health Administration advises handling dimethylmercury with highly resistant laminated gloves with an additional pair of abrasion-resistant gloves worn over the laminate pair, and also recommends using a face shield and working in a fume hood. It's been over 25 years since the death of Karen Wetterhan, but her passing is still keenly felt amongst her peers. It shouldn't have happened in a modern lab setting, but it seems even the experts had no idea how incredibly toxic dimethylmercury was although perhaps they should have, as Karen is not the only person to have died at the hands of dimethylmercury. As early as 1865, two workers at the laboratory of Frankfurt died after exhibiting progressive neurological symptoms following accidental exposure to the compound. And on the 15th of July 2011, a German man was stabbed in Hanover with an umbrella spike that had been laced with dimethylmercury. He died a year later from mercury poisoning. Karen's death also highlighted to chemists that they might not fully understand how toxic some chemicals can be, or how protective their safety procedures and equipment are. Karen will always be remembered for her pioneering work in the field of metal toxicology, and her work helped define the way scientists thought about chromium toxicity and its effects on human DNA. She also paved the way for more women to enter the field of science through Dartmouth's Women in Science project that she helped set up, and three decades later, almost 2,300 students have participated in Dartmouth's Women in Science project, and its model has been replicated in more than 100 other schools. Karen's death was avoidable, and is a huge loss to not only the science community, but the family and friends who loved her, and her influence will continue to be felt in different ways for years to come. Thanks for watching this video, and we'll see you in the next one.